apologize for being late, incidentally. My um, presentation was on a USB drive which was in a car, and the car didn't turn up, so it's vitally important that we found the car, which we've now done. The presentation is actually KDU8, and the reason it's version 8 is because every time I had a communication from the KDU, we seem to cut the time down by five minutes, and I think it's now at minus 10 minutes, so I won't be too, too, uh, too long. And what I'm going to talk about is, um, to paraphrase the title, is the design of an information system to enhance the situation awareness of emergency decision makers. And I'm going to approach that in the reverse order. So I say a little first about emergency decision making, and then I'll try to unpack situation awareness, and finally go on to the design of an information system which is intended to enhance that. So what is emergency When we're talking about emergencies, we're talking here about natural emergencies, and you would have noticed that uh, New Zealand, from where I come, has had quite a few of those recently. We've had the dreadful earthquakes in Christchurch, who killed of over 130 people. Um, two weeks ago, we had volcanic eruption, and in fact, Auckland, where I work, is built on 40 volcanoes, some of which are said to be dormant. And also, just recently, we've had this last week floods as well in the North Island, New Zealand. So it's uh, said to be a wonderful place to visit. The indication is you don't want to visit too long. Perhaps you don't want to live there either. But it's, it is a lovely place. And the other aspect of emergency decision-making, of course, could be terrorists, which we heard a lot about this morning. So why is emergency decision-making different? We have some of the reasons. High stress levels, limited time available to make decisions compared with what we normally have. We can muse, muse over things and make the decisions in our own time, not so in these situations. The situation is constantly evolving, continuously. Uh, incomplete data is often uh, available to us, and sometimes we get so much data we simply don't know what to do with it. And so that can be an overload, which is a bit of a problem too. And of course, within emergencies, very often lives and infrastructure are at stake. So emergency decision-making is quite different from the ordinary decision-making we're familiar to. It consists of understanding the situation. The term is used, awareness, and I'll explain what that is in a moment, and suggesting actions to normalize it. So our purpose in, in getting a, a good idea and understanding of the situation is to make decisions so that we can return events to normal as soon as we can. And if any of these things, is uh, this understanding is subnormal, then our actions are likely to be equally uh, poor. So let's just have a look at what situation awareness is. Well, everybody, if we ask the question, what is situation awareness, would probably give the first answer. It's an understanding of what's going on around us. But it's actually more complicated than that. And the understanding of situation awareness, particularly in, in this context of emergencies, and it was originally applied by Ensley to, uh, to pilots uh, and flying aircraft, uh, perceives situation awareness is at three different levels. First of all, there's perception, where we acquire the data via the senses, usually sight and sound, but not invariably. Then as a consequence of having the data in front of us, we have some idea of what's going on. We go through a, a comprehension session, um, and uh, we, ex we extract from the data useful information, which is directed to the user goals. And then finally, as a consequence of having that understanding, we can now project the future and take some actions. And these are referred to as level one, level two, and level three essays in Endley's, in Endley's uh, terminology. And we can unpack that even a bit further. We can talk about individual situation awareness, and we, could de we define that as the extent to which each individual understands the situation. But of course, emergency managers don't work individually. They work in teams and in groups. And so it's important that they have, they have able to share the information. So we talk about shared situation awareness. And that's the extent to which each manager possesses the same understanding of the situation. This is very important. So they have a coherent understanding which produces a coherent decision. And uh, the, the, uh, the notion that the emergency managers work in teams to achieve an overall goal or goals also has to be broken down in terms of the sub-goals that each of the individuals has to execute. So we talk then about team situation awareness, and that's the extent to which each manager possesses the situation awareness which is required for their own role, but this role that they have within the team has to be discharged in relation to the other manager's role. So it's quite a complex situation. It looks simple, just understand the situation. It really isn't that simple. And good emergency teamwork requires high levels of all of these three factors. So how do we use this understanding of situation awareness in order to design a system which hopefully would increase that uh, aspect? We hear the overall design principles. What we do is to build an emergency scenario. And the one I will illustrate is the scenario of a tsunami. 
And we, what we do is to look at the tsunami uh, uh, as, it, as it develops and we, we go through the phases of it, the confirmation, yes, there is a tsunami, evacuation of people to get out of the path of the tsunami, what happens once they're evacuated, how do we actually go ret begin to turn things to normal and then finally returning to normality itself. And of course, each of the managers within this situation of which they need to be aware has a role and so we have to identify along with those phases the various roles that are necessary in order to execute the whole plan of evacuating people and returning things to normal. So planning, operations, logistics, welfare, associated tasks and goals uh, that are necessary in order to carry out the whole, ex the whole um, response process in an efficient and effective way. And what we, we've done in this uh, particular piece of research is uh, we've carried out lots of interviews with expert um, managers, uh, response managers. We've looked at the two national exercises which we had in New Zealand, one of which is over a tsunami and the other was uh, on an earthquake, and various documents associated with that. And we've extracted all the contextualized information which the individuals in the team need to have. And so what we're interested in doing here is to see whether that information can be presented in usable form and then shared from one manager to another so that everybody is understanding in a shared way the, the situation. And the system that we produce then provides advice on all these three levels of uh, situation awareness and actually predicts the future so that we can make some decisions to what's likely to happen and take the action before it actually happens. And we've used an ontology process for that purpose. Ontology, you probably know, comes from philosophy, but its definition here is, is rather different. It specifies the features of a specific scenario. In this case, the domain is of a tsunami. And it treats those as concepts, and it defines the relationship between these concepts of the attributes. And using the inference engine associated with the ontology, then uh, we uh, can use rules and, uh, to infer future values of these concepts within your domain and your ontology. Uh, you can integrate information from diverse sources, and uh, it's, a, it's a fairly straightforward uh, approach developing an ontology using the OWL and XML modeling languages. And uh, particularly important is that the outcome of this process is machine understandable and therefore modifiable at runtime. And on the right-hand side there you can see, uh, I think it's a high-level ontology related to the various phases. And we've developed this prototype and I apologize for the title, I wince every time I see it, Situation Aware Vigilant Emergency Reasoner. And the purpose of calling it that is the nice mnemonic comes out, SAVER. And so that sounds simple. So the SAVER prototype is uh, programmed in Owl and Protégé. The example scenario that I describe is the tsunami. And here's the, uh, the um, um, scenario, scenario um, uh, example itself. Um, following an earthquake, SAVER receives the location of the earthquake. Now, if that's underwater, then, of course, a tsunami is possible, and that's level one information, that is uh, raw, raw data, as it were. Then within the um, a programming uh, aspect, within the software, there are rules on earthquake depth and magnitude and wave height, and these come from a deep ocean assessment and reporting uh, sensors, and these will determine if the tsunami is likely to be generated, and that's level two, it's a comprehension level. If confirmed, then incoming data, such as the speed and direction of the, uh, of the waves, can be used to track the progress of the waves and combined with other textual information uh, from previous experience and the documents and those interviews, they can provide advice and give predictions on future situations. So this is a sort of very crude representation of what comes up on the screen. So you've got a map there press enough of these, then it, you'll get an indication that, a, uh, that a, an earthquake has been, has been uh, sensed at uh, magnitude 8.1. It is in, uh, in water, so it's high enough to operate to, to generate a tsunami. And on the bottom of the left-hand side, you've got this message that comes up which says earthquake generated. And then we move ahead, and because uh, the earthquake is there, um, and because these, uh, the circumstances are such that it will generate a tsunami, then we move to a little uh, icon which says tsunami generated and on the bottom of the screen you see tsunami progress starting and present and then the, pro the program can then map out the progress of the, um, of, the, of the tsunami wave and here we go and you see the update on the bottom giving the times of the start and the, and the present position. Now eventually of course, uh, well initially the waves will be fairly um, circular but of course they, they stop being circular after a while due to all sorts of circumstances and after a particularly long time, that's the sort of circumstance that you might see in this scenario. And of course, if you live in Auckland, which is on the top left, uh, the top uh, part of, of New Zealand there, 
you can see the tsunami would reach the beaches and it's not a place you want to be. So it would be good to move from the North Island down to the South Island. And I think the final indication here is this is where you might expect to see the darts, the sensors of where the, the wave is. And all, um, they, they give further information on the progress of the tsunami. Now that is a very crude version of what actually comes up on the screen. It's just illustrated. So how do you go about um, evaluating such a program which is there, there to increase situation awareness? We use a technique which is uh, quite provocative in some ways, again due to Ensley, called SAGAT, Situation Awareness Global Assessment Technique. It evaluates the performance of SAVA in the, the tsunami threat scenario. Uh, you, you set the participants a task. In this case, the task was to produce a situation report. And at some defined points during the task, you freeze the sequence. And what you do is ask the participants questions which are relative to the three levels of situation awareness, shared situation awareness, and team situation awareness. And you compare these with reality. And the percent correct answer simply measures the extent of the situation awareness. And you do that with um, people using SAVER and with people not using SAVER. And you make a comparison to see whether the situation awareness has uh, improved. And those people who are not using SAVER are given information, but they are not giving the advice that SAVER gives those people. Here are some of the sample questions. I'll pass across this quite quickly in order to preserve time. The first level sir, uh, questions will be factual ones of just data. The second, where the comprehension will begin to come in. And the third will be when you've got the predictions. Um, for example, the last one, if evacuation is necessary, are there special requirements? You know about where the area is. If it was in Auckland, uh, then there will be several hospitals which will be affected by the tsunami and you will make necessary preparations for evacuating people who are very immobile. So I just present some um, fairly minimal results, so there's a great, great number of them just to give you some representative understanding. Uh, the red uh, graph there, the red line, is the situation of situation awareness approaching 100% in some cases. With, um, on the, the bottom scale, the abscissa, is the uh, number of um, people that were involved, uh, 16 managers in this case. And then the blue line is without using SAVER. And although uh, the difference is not great, it's certainly a statistically significant difference which demonstrates that SAVER does increase the situation awareness at all these levels. And here's a summary of the results at the various levels, individual, shared, and team. And again, the p-value will give you confidence that these differences between the with and without SAVER are statist statistically significant. So let's just summarize the conclusions. Um, SAVER, uh, as the prototype that we've developed, um, offers proof of concept. Let me not claim too much for this. This is a prototype. It just offers a proof of concept. And it's evidence that the ontology approach to situation awareness oriented design produces a decision support system, and that's extremely important. It's not taking away the decisions from the managers. It's just supporting their decisions. And it improves SA at all of these levels. The intuitive observation that providing factual data and then contextual information advice improves individual SA is confirmed. I mean, it's, it, it is intuitive, isn't it? Because if I ask you what is 3 plus 3 and then tell you that the answer is 6 and then ask you again what is the answer, you would know exactly what it was. So what is being proven here, what is being validated, is the uh, implementation, not so much the, uh, the theory part. Um, how does it work? Well, we, we believe that the situation awareness and more work is necessary to be done here. Focuses managers' attention, it provides prompts and reminders, and because the information and device is coming to you in a proactive, um, delivered way, it reduces the workload and pressure. You don't have to decide upon these things for yourselves. You can get the information and then make your decisions. We've demonstrated that the prototype can draw inferences, and that's extremely important to get to the level three SA and sharing the same situation the projection helps manage to develop a common understanding. So it's, uh, it all seems to work extremely well in the prototype. Future work. Um, the experiments that we've carried out would be sufficient for a PhD student to get his PhD, and that's what has happened in this case. Then uh, we have to recognize that we need to apply the extra tests, and, uh, and using a, uh, a real situation will be extremely useful to do. Uh, using real data from uh, a real tsunami uh, type um, uh, threat. Um, we would like to study all sorts of implementation issues. I just gave you one screen which demonstrated a display, but the use of mobile devices and touch screens and using cloud information as well, I think will be extremely important to develop into the whole process. Um, what you get from the advice is one uh, suggestion. There might be several which will be alternatives, so option awareness is another aspect 
And um, wouldn't it be interesting to apply this not just to this simulation, but also to business and military domains? So that gives you a flavor, if you like, of the sort of work that we've been doing to produce this, um, this saver prototype, which I think has some considerable importance in development, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done to follow that through. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Tony Norris. Uh...